I'm just going to start off with a few sentences in Chinese because I know the novel coronavirus is really of uh, great interest to people in China naturally because that's where the outbreak is. And then I'll switch back to English. So just hang in there. Uh, okay, so here we go, back into English. Um, today we want people to understand some of the really basic overarching questions that are very important. Um, what we know about the disease, because I know you've heard a lot about what we don't know about the disease, but to help people understand what we do know, um, who is at risk and who isn't. I think a lot of people are worried who shouldn't be and will help you understand what category you're in, how, you can how people can protect themselves, um, when somebody should go to a doctor, when you should be concerned, when you should go to a doctor, and what we can do to help doctors and nurses and other health workers who are facing this disease at the moment. So let's start out, Dr. Van Kurkova, with what we know about this disease. Maybe just a little bit about your background and why it is that we have you talking to us today. So thank you, Nika. Hello, everyone. Um, so I, I'm an epidemiologist and I work in our health emergencies program. And my background is in respiratory diseases. So uh, I spent quite a lot of time working on influenza, um, avian influenza, which is a virus that moves from birds to uh, people. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm our MERS uh, focal point, so Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus focal point. And in this current response, I am the technical lead um, in, in terms of the response for WHO. So what that means, and what I've seen her doing, is she's the one coordinating with all the various teams who are working on this. The people who are working on labs, the people who are doing calls with the doctor and nurses who are actually treating people sick with the disease. And helping, I think one of the things you do is almost raise the questions that we need answers to, and then reach out to partners and see who can help us answer that type of question. And also make sure WHO is uh, putting together the right guidance, so if we need guidance for uh, how a laboratory should test for this disease, um, and so on, we're saying we need to develop that guidance. Is that about right? That's right. And okay. what we are trying to do here is build upon experiences that we've had with other types of respiratory viruses. This novel coronavirus, novel meaning new, it's something we, hadn't, we haven't seen before. And so when something is new, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, we're filling those unknowns at the moment, but we're building on experiences and utilizing our network partners across the globe to help make, make the most informed guidance to all countries. So we're not starting from zero, we're really building on Correct. knowledge we and partners had already. That's right. So what do we know about this disease then? So what we know is that this is a, a novel coronavirus, a new coronavirus that, not, that has not previously been detected in people before. Um, it was first identified in a cluster, a cluster, a group of yeah. individuals with pneumonia in a city called Wuhan in China. Um, and this, this was picked up by Chinese authorities through a surveillance system that they put in place after SARS in 2003. The medical surveillance system where they look for unusual events in the hospital system? Yes, like that? that's, that's right, that's yep. right. And because this is a novel coronavirus, what we know is that people who are infected with this virus develop respiratory disease which means some people will have mild symptoms, which could range from a fever or a runny nose or a slight cough, but some people can also develop pneumonia, and in some patients and some people, um, they can have very severe disease and die. So that's really scary to hear that some people have died from the disease, and we want you to understand um, how bad it is. So of a, of a, if 100 people have the disease, no. what percentage uh, will have that mild disease as you described and then what percentage might die based on what we know so far and we know it, it can change. Yeah, based on what we know so far, um, 80 people have died out of the total number of people that have been reported. It's about 4%, 3 to 4%. That is a very early number um, in terms of, of uh, percentage and that will likely change as more information becomes available. So 80 of the 2,000 plus 2,700, yes. Yes. Or the percentage of people you died, who have About died, are two, three, or four percent. Yes, that's right. That's now right. that doesn't mean it's not severe. It doesn't no. mean it's not a dangerous disease. It just means that everybody that's infected will will not necessarily develop severe disease and die. Um, so when we do surveillance, when we look for cases, um, we tend to look for people who go to healthcare facility and go to hospital, and those are the people that have disease. What we don't pick up from surveillance systems are those that have the more mi we call the mild. Uh, end of the spectrum of disease, and it's it's important that as Chinese authorities continue.
continue to look for cases, they may find individuals um, who have more mild disease. And that will likely change you know, the proportion of people that die. It will change over time. Yes. Now, we're asking you um, to send us your questions with the hashtag AskWHO. And we have a few questions already, okay. so I'll hit you with those. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, here we have one question from uh, Kashif Ahmed, who is asking, how does the virus spread? So Kashif, that's a very good question. Um, what we're trying to understand, what we, what we know from uh, reporting, is that transmission occurs through a respiratory route, which means droplets. So these are small particles um, that either transmitted through like a sneeze or a cough. Um, but transmission between people occurs amongst very close contacts, so family members or healthcare workers. Um, so you have to have, be in close proximity to one another. We also know um, that this is a coronavirus um, and the original source of this outbreak is likely an animal source. That's currently under investigation. We haven't identified the animal source, but in the beginning of this outbreak, uh, what we believe is ha has happened is that uh, the virus moved from an animal to people. So two types of transmission, transmission from an animal to people um, and now between people, but mainly amongst close contacts. So the idea being that at the beginning of this outbreak, the, the first people or the first wave of people who are getting sick somehow got sick, maybe related to this market or to another animal. Yes. And then since then it has been more from one person to another person in the family who may be caring for them right. or in a clinic or a hospital where the doctor or nurse is caring for a patient and therefore is very close to them and maybe That's exposed right. to some of the symptoms. That's right. Now somebody on Twitter is asking, is it true, however, that people who are asymptomatic, meaning they're not coughing, they're not sneezing, they don't have really runny noses, that somebody with the disease without symptoms could still make you sick? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, so we've seen some reports that it's possible that people who don't have any symptoms can transmit to other individuals. This is what we call an asymptomatic person could potentially transmit. We've only seen some, some case reports of this, so very few numbers. Um, with other coronaviruses, such as Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, we know that this is possible, but it's happening in a very limited extent. Um, but we're still trying to find out more. I think we people are. are very concerned on that. Yeah, we are still question. trying to find out more. Um, and this, this would make things a little bit more difficult, but we, still, we would still recommend the same things, you know, in terms of making sure that um, if you're not feeling well, you know, you stay home. Um, and you practice good hand hygiene, uh, where you're washing your hands with soap and water or an alcohol rub, making sure that when you practice respiratory hygiene, you're sneezing into your elbow, you're using a tissue and you're throwing that away right away. Um, that doesn't change no matter what. Um, so practicing that good, that good respiratory etiquette and hand hygiene etiquette is really important for flu season for any type of respiratory disease. Now you said if you're feeling unwell, stay home, but mm -hmm. there's some conditions around that. Yes, so if you, if you do have fever and you have a cough, um, it, it, you should... It, you and should, difficulty breathing. Thank you, and, and difficulty breathing. It is important that you do seek health care. Now this isn't, I mean this does apply for anybody at any time. If you have difficulty breathing, of course you need to seek health care. Yes. But I think particularly at the time of this outbreak, we're adding a bit more around that, saying that if you are in the area where the where the virus is transmitted, where, the, where there are other people getting sick with the disease. Yes. I think it's important to say, we, did, we didn't say this at the beginning, I think it's important to say that in terms of the case numbers, in terms of where we know this virus is circulating, um, this virus is circulating in China, um, and there, it did start in this area of Wuhan, but there is some circulation in other cities in China. Um, and of all of the people who have traveled from China to another country, there are some cases that have traveled from China to another country. Um, those people have typically been um, mild, um, and there hasn't been any onward transmission. There haven't been any outbreaks in other countries. And so not everybody across the globe is at risk for this, for this virus. It's important to know where the virus is circulating, and so you, you, can, you can determine what your individual risk may be. So it's in 12 other countries at the moment. Yes. But a total of 30 cases. 37 cases. 37 cases. In so 12 that's, other countries. That's very small groups of people in these other countries at the moment. And the vast 
number of people sick with the disease are in Wuhan and some other provinces in China. Yes, and, and what we are trying to do is we are trying to, to provide information and provide advice to all countries of the world to what to look out for. Um, you know, should a case come to their country, what should they do in terms of early identification, making sure that those patients and those people are cared for and communicated with and so that there isn't any onward spread. So people are, some, several people are asking questions if there's any kind of treatment. Um, people have heard things like alcohol or certain kinds of oil can be helpful. Um, so is there any treatment for this new disease? So because this is a new disease, it's a new virus, yeah. we don't have specific treatments for that virus. But because this virus causes respiratory disease, um, th those symptoms are treated. Um, we've heard a lot about antibiotics, um, and this is a virus, so antibi antibiotics won't work against the virus. No. no. So, um, but I should say that there are treatments that are in development, and this is really important because for the past many years, many treatments um, have been, uh, are, are being looked at to treat other coronaviruses like MERS uh, coronavirus, and hopefully those treatments can be useful for the novel coronavirus. And how do you go about testing those new treatments? How do you know which ones work? So that's a very good question. It's a very important question. It needs to be done in, in the right way. Um, so for example, for MERS coronavirus, there's a clinical trial that's ongoing right now in Saudi Arabia that's looking specifically at the use of some potential therapeutics for those patients. And we, we're hopeful that uh, clinical trials um, could be used for this novel coronavirus as well. And there's already, a, you said two? There's already two underway? There's the one that's ongoing right now, and there's one for MERS uh, that may uh, begin again. And there is an exchange between scientists. I think it's, it's important, Nika, that, that the people know that the whole entire global community is working together to try to better understand this virus, to try to better understand how it's transmitted to, to treat patients. And we're using the experiences from, from, from the past to help now. And so Chinese authorities are working together with a, a, a large group of international partners to help try to, um, to, support, to support patients. Got another, well, we have a lot of questions. We're not able to get to all of them. This one's for, from Dora Garby, who's asking, how do you distinguish, how does somebody know, um, how do you distinguish between a normal flu and uh, coronavirus symptoms? So Dora, this is, this is a tough one. This is a good question because when someone comes in with a respiratory disease, it, it's very difficult, if not impossible, initially to determine what they're infected with. Um, and so what we rely on are diagnostics. So um, I should say very, very quickly after this virus was identified by Chinese authorities, they made the sequence available. So this is the part of uh, you know what, what is this virus itself? They made it publicly available. Uh, and because they did that, diagnostics were molecular tests, like a PCR test. Um, were very quickly developed, and so lots of countries can actually test for, um, for this virus. So if somebody comes in with a respiratory disease, they will take a sample, usually like a respiratory swab um, sample, and, and run a test. Is it influenza? Is it coronavirus? Is it something else? And most of the time, it will be something else. Yes. I mean, if you look at the global scale, if you look at the population of Wuhan even, the number of people who are sick with this disease, even though it's, it's very many people and, and we worry for those people and we know it must be very scary for people in those areas, yeah. the vast majority of people are probably sick with quote unquote normal flu because it is flu season. Yes, that's right. That's right. So it makes it, I would think it's a very difficult, it's quite a challenge for healthcare workers to be able to distinguish is this a person who's sick with a new disease or is this someone who's having a bad flu? Yes, and it's really important that in, in healthcare facilities, particularly in areas where this virus is circulating, that, that we protect them um, and that they, they adhere to what we call infection prevention and control measures. These are measures that they would take to ensure that when they come in contact with a patient that they're wearing appropriate gloves or masks, depending on how they care for that patient. At the moment, when you see, um, when you hear what's happening in Wuhan, uh, it seems like the hospitals um, are overwhelmed. There's 
there's more patients than they're able to care for. Some of the hospitals are overwhelmed at the moment. Yes. How can WHO help with that situation? What kind of advice can we provide to help the, those healthcare workers and the patients who are worried um, to have a more streamlined system? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Um, so one of the things you mentioned before for individuals, you know, if you are feeling a little bit unwell, stay home and that's important to do. But if you have fever, cough, and you have difficulty breathing, then go in to see, to see healthcare. Um, it is important to provide uh, healthcare workers um, with information and making sure that they know about what this, this virus is, making sure that they have adequate um, uh, protection uh, when they treat patients, and making sure that there are an, enough facilities to be able to care for individuals who are sick. As well. We have a lot of questions. So, okay. um, there is one question that's, uh, that I'll, I'll answer actually as, a, as one of our media officers. People asking why WHO hasn't yet declared this a global emergency, a public health emergency of international concern, which is very specific language we use. Um, the Director General of WHO, uh, when he is concerned that an issue may be a, a global emergency, calls together a committee of experts and they advise him whether they think it does constitute a, a, global, a public health emergency of international concern. It's the wording we use. Um, we met, uh, that committee met twice in two days, one after the other, and weren't able to say yet, based on current information, if they thought this constituted a public health emergency. And the Director General decided, for now, not to declare it that, but he said very clearly, this doesn't mean it's not an emergency in China, it absolutely is. Mm -hmm. It also doesn't mean we're not acting. WHO has been acting since we first heard of this cluster, as you said, this group of cases of a new, of a, what, in the end, yeah. um, was clearly a new virus. So that the networks of experts are engaged. Um, we're working with uh, our logisticians, for example, are looking at what kind of materials countries need to have on hand, sharing those lists with countries so they know what to do and so on. That action is happening. And that committee could be reconvened very, very quickly in a, a matter of days. The director general could decide to reconvene, reconvene the, the uh, committee and look at that question again. Yes. So, um, people are wondering if there's a vaccine. We talked about therapeutics. Is there a vaccine? Is there something in development that could help people uh, become immune to the virus? So, vac there is no specific vaccine for this new coronavirus, but there are vaccines that are in development. Um, over the last several years, um, there's been quite a bit of uh, re research and development on vaccines for coronaviruses. Um, and those are they're still in development. We're hopeful that this could be useful um, for a coronavirus in the future. It does take time though, um, but there are a number of scientists that are working very hard to see if this is something that could be accelerated uh, and advanced quite quickly. There's some people asking whether um, receiving packages from Wuhan or China uh, would put them at risk in any way. Yeah, so have we seen that question a lot? Um, no, I mean, it, you're, you're not at risk of this virus from receiving a package. Sometimes we look at viruses and, and how, they, how long they can survive on a, on a surface, for example, mm -hmm. um, and they don't survive very long. Um, so if you're receiving something from overseas from, from China, uh, you, you're not at risk of, this, of, of contracting this disease. Okay. A uh, question from at Sugar Olivia. She's asking what age group are most affected by the virus? So thanks, Olivia. Um, that's a good question. Um, we have an age range of, of people that have been reported to have been infected, and they range from the very young, so some children, um, to the to older individuals. Um, I don't have a clear breakdown of, of all of the ages of all of the people, but they've mostly been adults. Um, we haven't had many uh, children. Um, uh, infected, um, but we do know that people that are older and do have underlying conditions, so underlying medical conditions, those are the individuals that are more likely to develop severe disease. So not everyone that's infected will, will get a severe disease. I think it's also important, not just um, your age group, but, but where you are. If Olivia's in Wuhan, then she may be, there may be people in her, around her, there may be people around her who are sick and therefore she might be at risk. If she's in another country or another part of China where nobody has had the disease, then her risk is much lower. Right. I think it's hard. Right. I mean, that's hard to explain, I think, and hard to understand because yes. especially if you hear, oh, it can go from one person to another, you might think you're at risk. Yes. Can you just recap for us what we say about how people can protect themselves against this disease and other 
um, respiratory illnesses. Right, so for, for this particular disease, um, people that are living in areas where this virus is circulating, it's, it's important that um, you, you, you practice good hand hygiene, you practice good respiratory etiquette, and you, you make sure um, that you don't, you don't come in close contact with somebody who has a, an illness um, and keep, keep some distance from them. When we say some distance, I think technically we say one to two meters. We say one to two meters, but that doesn't always translate very well. But yeah, three feet to six feet away, away, from, away from an individual that mm -hmm. is sick. Um, and make sure that if you're un feeling unwell, you stay home, except if you have fever, cough, and um, uh, difficulty breathing, then go to see healthcare. Now we talk about hand washing all the time, and I think people might wonder, how does that even work? Why do we talk about hand washing? So can we get a, a little bit gross and talk a little <laughs> bit about why? I mean, like where, I just touched my nose exactly. just now. Yes. So it's it's the it's the respiratory liquids like saliva from your mouth and what might drip out of your nose. That's where the virus would come from. Yes, and and you touch your face hundreds of times per day, uh, if not hundreds of times per hour. So it's really important that you wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water or an alcohol rub because you are constantly touching, surf, not even related to this particular virus, but, but anything. You want to make sure that your hands are nice and clean because if you touch something that's soiled, that's For dirty. For example, somebody who re who's sick and has recently touched it. You could touch your eyes or touch your nose or touch your mouth and, and, and get infected that way. So it is important that you do wash your hands. Okay, and there's one thing we forgot to mention earlier as well, that if you are somebody who has been, who are not in um, parts of China where there's the outbreak, but you have been in contact, you have been close with someone who has been from that area, um, then when you go see your doctor, if you have the, the fever, the cough, and the difficulty breathing, you tell them your travel history. And so that applies for people in other countries as well. Yes. But we always talk about that link back to, back to Wuhan. That's right. So it's not just what type of disease you may have. If you have a respiratory disease, it's what type of exposure you may have had. So it is important that if you did travel recently, that you tell your healthcare provider not only that you've been to China, for example, but where within China you've been. And this, I think, is important as well. Um, Sometimes people will start thinking that every Chinese person is carrying the disease and, yeah. and they start being afraid of their neighbor who's from China. Yeah. So that's why it's so important for us to say it's not, it's, it's no. very much related to the location and to people who are sick. You have to see if there's that link to that location or to people who are sick. That's that right. Yes, that's a very good way to put it. Okay. Um, uh, so we talked about when to see a doctor. We talked about who is at risk. Let me see what other questions we have. Um, here we have someone named uh, Shelling00 who's asking, can the virus be spread um, during the incubation period? So I guess that's what we talked about as, as well. Before somebody starts coughing and sneezing, yeah. can you still get sick from them? It's possible. It's possible. And we've seen some case reports on this. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, it's, it's important that there are certain types of investigations and studies that are underwear where we look at this more systematically from patients. Just because this has happened from some, it doesn't mean that it happens from all. From all. Yeah. And then I know we sort of just talked about this, but just to repeat it again, if I was someone who was sick with the virus, but I'm not yet coughing and sneezing, so I'm not coughing on your face, how could I make you sick? If I was carrying the virus but hadn't yet started having symptoms, how would I make you so sick? So it, it, again, it's these droplets. It's these, um, if, if you were sneezing or coughing or spitting. But I'm not sneezing or coughing. But you're not sneezing or no coughing. Symptoms. It's very difficult. It would be a very difficult to transmit between people that way. That's why we need to do, it, it's not a great answer because it doesn't give you the exact thing that you want. But yeah. this is why we need to do certain types of studies to, to determine to how understand. exactly do people get infected in, in, in what way. But would it still be, I mean, is it still related to the liquids in my nose and my mouth? Would it be if I had touched my nose, used my phone, passed the phone to you, and then you we're like, not sure. We're not sure, but likely. I mean, we, I bring it back to MERS because that's the example that I know of. Um, and what we think may be happening is that somebody may be carrying it up in their, up in their upper uh, respiratory tract, we say. And then almost transmitting it like a fomite, like something that's on a surface, mm -hmm. and transmitting it from me, just, just, like, you, just like you explained. Okay. But we do need more information before we can say for certain if that is happening, um, how often that is happening, and why it's happening. Okay. There's a lot of questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, and we have to wrap up soon. But we'll, okay. be, we'll be doing these more regularly. You'll get a chance to ask us more questions. 
Um, and do keep your eye on our website, who.int. There's this whole section on coronavirus. There's Q and A's there, questions and answers. Um, we have many posts on social media. You can ask questions there as well. Um, so this is an important one. Is it true the virus is mutating? Mm. And people always, you hear that word mutating, which sounds really scary. So do we know, how, is the virus changing? So there is a global network of scientists and virologists that are looking at all of the sequences that are becoming available. And I should say, again, we're very grateful for all of the sequences that are becoming available from not only China, but, but countries that are seeing patients. They're looking, we are looking at all of these viruses to determine if there are changes. We haven't seen any evidence that the virus has changed or that it has mutated, but it is a common question that comes, since this is new, this must be different, this mm -hmm. must have changed. Um, but we're watching this very closely and we haven't seen any evidence that it's mutated or that it's changed. Not for now, but keeping an eye on it. That's right. Okay, I think this will be our last question. Um, it's from Sway T. Pamela from Palau. Okay. Um, Hi, what should Sway. you recommend? What would you recommend to all the hospitals around the world, especially this tiny island in the Micronesian region, about what to do and how to help people? So thanks for that question. That's a that's a very important question. One of the things I say when I when I talk to people and I talk to ministries, I talk to family. Um, you know, the most important um, place in a country, in, in a city, is the hospitals. It's the emergency departments. Just making sure that they um, are aware of, of people that may come in with whatever, even if it's flu, um, and that we they have standard infection prevention and control. Making sure that all of these applications of hand washing, making sure that PPE is there, um, is enforced. And that's really, really important. So you mean as simple as making sure that the doctors and nurses and the cleaners, they have the right gowns and the right masks, masks the that right. there's hand washing stations or hand cleaning stations for them throughout. And that they're used. Mm -hmm. So not only is it there, and that's very important, but also that it's used by all of the healthcare professionals. So that has to do with training, I imagine, and yes, protocols it, and management has to be sure that they make it possible for people to do all these things. Yes, that's right. That's okay. right. So. Please let us know if we have an answered really burning question for you, if we've confused you somehow, and it's, it is quite a confusing topic, so we hope we haven't brought confusion but have brought more clarity. This situation is going to continue to evolve, so please keep asking us your questions. Let us know what you need to know from us, and we'll do our best to share that with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maria Van Kerkova, for being with us today, and thank you for your interest as well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Just wait.